Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. It's good to see you, and I'm sure that the Lord has been good to each one of us through this week. And we are here this morning to praise his name and to thank him for all of his mercies to each of us. I have an announcement here, or a card to read from the, um, from the youth. As you remember, uh, a few weeks ago, the youth had their day, and so they would just like to, um, to have this card read. With special thanks, this extra special thank you note sent to you today holds more appreciation than any words can say. For you're among the nicest people we have ever known, and you, you'll never be forgotten for the thoughtfulness you've shown. Thanks for everything. That's from the youth department. Before we have our opening prayer, I would like to read a text from Lamentations, the third chapter, and beginning with verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him and to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Has your hope been in the Lord this week? Has your faith increased? Hopefully we can all say yes. Let us prepare for prayer at this time. As far as possible, those who may can kneel. It is good, Lord, to come before you this morning and to thank you for all your mercies and blessings and to know that it is because of your love, grace, and mercy that we are not consumed. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus and for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit here with us this morning. We pray that your spirit will move up and down these aisles, touch every heart, Lord, and as you look at each one of us this morning, Lord, grant us the blessings that you see that each one of us stand in need of. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to call upon you, to trust you. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for our shortcomings and for our sins. We ask your blessings upon uh, those that may have some spirit special request this morning, <clears throat> or any that may be seeking healing, we pray for, for those also. We ask that you would be with Brian <clears throat> as he delivers the message this morning, Lord. Thank you again for your mercies. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe on the dangerous highways and from the pandemic. And Lord, Many have lost their lives in the marketplaces, and you have seen fit to spare us there also. We ask, Father, your blessings upon this 
this service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you guys know what this is? What is this? Anyone know? No? What is it? It's a woolly bear. Yeah, it's a woolly bear. And yes, there's a woolly bear festival coming up. Yeah, it's going to be tomorrow, 9 o'clock till about 7.30, I think. Now, do you know that the woolly bear has a unique kind of a life? It starts out as a little bitty egg. And it, yeah, a little bitty egg. Like a little, well, like a little tiny speck of an egg. And it, yeah, that little. And it grows into a caterpillar. And then when it gets to a certain age, it has like a cocoon that wraps around it. Yeah. And inside the cocoon, can you imagine what happens? What do you think happens? Don't know? It turns to mush. Yeah, it's little fuzzy little body turns to mush. Yeah, they turn and they call that metamorphosis. It's turning into something. And while they're growing inside that cocoon, that cocoon starts having little antennas. You know what an antenna is? Yeah, they, they get to feel what's going on in the world. Then they get little arms and little legs. And while they're in the cocoon, and the cocoon starts to grow, what else do you think it grows? Inside. Wings. Yeah, it starts growing wings. When the wings get big enough, they open up. And they fly away. We're kind of like, we have metamorphosis. When we're a little tiny egg... We're kind of like, hmm, we're just getting to know God. We're starting to hear the stories, and the more stories we hear, we turn into a caterpillar. Yeah. And then when we get so old, then we get surrounded by God's wings, and we get baptized. And inside, when we're inside God's wings, he turns our, heart, our stony hard hearts to mush so we can love. And the more we learn about God's love, the more we start to learn how we can love and be just like Jesus. And we start opening up, and the more we get opened up in our cocoon, our wings stretch out. And we go and tell the whole world everything we've learned about God. You want to be a little egg? Let's be a little egg. Come on, let's be a little egg. Yeah, little tiny egg. And we're going to grow up and be a caterpillar. Let's grow into a caterpillar. Let's get covered by the cocoon. Let's let our wings fly. Yeah. We're going to go fly and tell the whole world how much Jesus loves us. Isn't that wonderful? In fact, we have in 1 Corinthians... Uh, 1552, it says, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. So we are going to go through a metamorphosis, and we're going to change, and we'll go and be with God. Isn't that nice? Okay, we need time for a little prayer. Okay, are we ready? Close our eyes. Bow our heads and remind ourselves that our prayers are going straight up to heaven. And that's not the way to pray. Come on, up you go. We got to pray in respect. Yeah, because God's watching. That's the way. Okay. Dear Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus, we come to you this day thanking you with all glory and Everything goes to you because you're so wonderful. You're going to change us. You're going to invite us to go to your home. You're going to give us the ability to spread your word. You're going to speak through us. You're going to give us the opportunity to tell the world that you love them and you want them with you. So please, dear Lord, fill my mouth with your words. Let me be your your example. Let me be 
what you want me to be, so the world will want to be as you want to be as well. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I don't know the new one. Can you hear me now? How is everybody doing this morning? You know, when they ask you to do a sermon, the first thing you have to come up with is a topic. And sometimes that's easy, and sometimes that's not so easy. And sometimes God doesn't really lay a burden on your heart until the, towards the very end. But I wanted to start out with my favorite topic, and that is heaven. Um, but before we get started this morning, I, I wanted to invite a friend this morning. How many here have ever invited a friend into church? All right. I'm going to invite a friend. Now, if you come over to my house, you always get a special chair. So I'm going to bring a special chair up here. I'm going to set my friend real close to me because he's going to have a front, front view this morning. I'm going to put my friend right here so he can be real close to me because if you have a friend they're part of your life right and they're close to you all the time so thank you for being here this morning God has made us a promise in John 14 how many people here have experienced pain suffering, maybe worry, worried about something this week? Am I the only one that has experienced something that uh, was worrisome this week? Is this world getting to be a safer, more happy place to live, or is it the opposite? I enjoy very much, always have since I was a little child, talking to elderly people. And the reason I do is because they have seen more of life than I have seen. And to the person, how many here are of the baby boom generation? And I think if I was to sit and ask each and every one of you, was life easier back in your day? Was it slower? Was it more serene versus today? I think we would all say to a letter that today things are too fast. People don't have time for one another. And people are tired. How many people here are tired of this world and tired of what is going on? The reason I love this verse so much, two reasons. God understands that we are in this sinful world right now, does he not? We're not home yet. But even though we're not home yet, God wants us to trust in him. As a Christian, do you find that you are... Hopefully, you're less stressed than your friends that are in the world. I hope so. Even though we still have problems, do we have a solution to these problems? It's more than what most of the world has. The, the title of my sermon today is Finding Heaven on Earth. We go back into this. Jesus is talking about heaven, about going to prepare a place for him. But we're not there yet, right? We're still dealing with this sinful world. So we're not there yet. But we have this hope. I've been thinking a lot about heaven through this pandemic, through all the stuff we have been going through. I'm a radio junkie. I like talk radio. I like to hear... I actually like politics, except nowadays people do not respect one another, and nothing is getting done. See, I, I believe that uh, as we as Christians, we should be able to sit down, and even if we have differences, we should be able to accomplish great things 
for God because we work with each other because what God has done for us. I like real estate. I love property. We actually had a chance this week, my wife and I, to look at a house down in Canton. It was built in 1856. This was an incredible house because the basement was built out of sandstone. The walls on that thing were 12 inches thick. The floors, I mean, it's a 165-year-old home. We were walking on the floors and not a creek one. That was one of the most solid built homes I had ever seen. Love property. I was driving the other day. I work over towards Menor, and there's a lot of neat old homes there. Uh, I didn't know President Garfield had a home over in Menor. I was driving one day and saw his farm. Pretty cool. I like old homes. I like uh, to see what the wealthy live in, just to daydream what it was like to live there. But each and every one of these homes have one thing in common. The owners that built the homes no longer live there. They all have died and, and gone away. But the memories are still there, right? Makes me think of the mansion. You know, each and every one of us are going to live in a home if we choose to follow God that is going to make anything here on earth pale in comparison. And I don't know about you, but do we really own homes here in heaven uh, or here on earth? Even if your house is paid off, do you really own it? Miss your taxes one time and see how much of that house is yours. And everything we do here on earth is temporal, right? So we can just hustle, 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 work, 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 build big, beautiful homes, acquire a lot of things, and it's all temporal. But Jesus is offering us something eternal. Got a question this morning. I don't think I'm the only one that's ever thought this. Do you ever wonder, all right, you know, Satan caused rebellion in heaven. How? Uh, it's always the big question. How did he get to the point where he rebelled? And have you ever thought, well, if Satan rebelled, may I, might I do the same thing when I go to heaven? What is going to keep me in heaven from rebelling against God. Have you ever thought of that? I've wondered about it. Mm, that's part of it. And let me ask you another thing. Would you even be happy in heaven? It's going to be a lot of things in heaven that are not here on earth. Have we... fell in love more with heaven or are we still holding on to earth? And that's something that I was going through my mind over and over and over again. Naomi, you said something this morning. It's amazing how when you put a sermon together how things in Sabbath school just always seems to flow. What does Jesus ask Christians to do in this world? What does he ask us to do? What is our assignment? Obey, God. obey is a part, but when you're obeying God, that's something personal, right? With God, I'm obeying his commandments. But what, does he, what charge does he give us as Christians to do? Spread the gospel. Part of spreading the gospel is, do we all have a story? I hope we all have a story of what sin you've had in your life and sins that you were able to overcome through Christ. Now, I know I'm not the only one here, and if we have anybody that's kind of new to church or has felt uncomfortable in church before, let me tell you one thing. This is not a country club for saints. This is a hospital for sinners. Each and every one of us struggle with sin. And we're not there yet. Now, I said earlier I invited a friend. I'm going to call this friend my burdens. 
My burdens have been very close to me my whole life. And I don't know if how, you'd have to be older to remember the show Leave it to Beaver. Yeah. I personally have never known anybody that grew up in a Leave it to Beaver home. I think each and every one of us would agree that we have had... Now, if you, if you grew up in a loving Christian home, what a blessing. But a lot of us hadn't. A lot of us have grown up in torn homes, homes uh, wrought with, with, with conflict, with divorce. I'm one of those. My, my parents got divorced when I was 18 years old, so... I was almost an adult, so you would think it would not have that much of an effect on an 18-year-old, but it really defined everything because I don't know if you guys know it, but when you're a child of a divorced parent, you have a divided, who do I be loyal to? Mm. So no longer mom and dad is in your home, so you feel torn on who to be with. And through that, sometimes you can have conflict and conflict that will carry on into everything and your burdens will become part of your life. Now, this is uh, called a kettlebell and you use it to exercise. Now, when I was younger, I could carry burdens much more easily. So I used to be able to pick this up and, you know, 40 times, no problem. Have you ever carried your burdens, year after year after year. Now, it was easier when I was younger to physically carry burdens. But as I get older and God starts working through me, these burdens are harder to carry. You know, it's interesting what sin does when you hold on to it. Does God want you to carry your burdens? Do I look pretty foolish here this morning, walking around carrying my burdens? Is it foolish as Christians for us to go around carrying our burdens? Or does God want us to lay them down? Because if you are, have relationships, you will take your relationships and everything that you come in contact with will be affected by the burden that you carry. Your marriage, your relationship with your children, your relationship, believe it or not, with your church family because of, you ever heard the term chip on your shoulder? I don't know how much longer I can carry this burden. It used to seem much easier when I was younger. One of the byproducts of carrying a burden is you the blessings that God wants to pour out in the life, your life, the healing in which he wants to give you is not there because you are holding on to this burden. Now i got to switch arms because that burden getting heavy. Why do we hold on to them? Why do we hold on to burdens? It, I know I'm not the only one here. I can tell you the negative effects that carrying burdens in your life your ability to have intimacy, for one, with your family, with your friends, with your wife, with your children, with your Lord, when we carry these burdens over and over and over. I even left the church for about seven years. I've told people before, and I was young at the time, I gave up my role as the spiritual head of my household and turned from God for seven years. That was a big burden. I was a lot younger then. I began to sweat, so we're going to have to lay this burden down pretty quickly. But I want to share with you. Came back in, I can't even remember how many years ago, Revelation Seminar they had in Tulsa. And I remember the evangelist saying, you need to take those burdens. Whew. <clears throat> And you need to lay them at the feet of Jesus and let him take these burdens. 
Because sometimes in life, your burdens or sin affects you so greatly and it's so painful that you in and of yourself are consumed by your sins and your burdens. But I have good news. You want to hear some good news? Jesus can and will take away your burdens. You do not have to live that type of life. Once I got to the point where I laid all these burdens down, my relationship started improving. My mom, who I had a problem with when I was younger, now I love. I have the best relationship with my mother I've ever had. Actually, one of the reasons I moved back to Ohio is so I could be by my mother. Fortunately, I waited, even though I forgave my dad and tried to patch these things up, it, it, uh, I waited too long. My dad passed away a few years ago and did not have time to patch him up. If you have issues with parents, with your wife, with your children, take the time to repair it, to repair those relationships. Once you put your burdens at the feet of Christ, your relationships, even with my lovely wife, you know, you'll carry your burdens on into everything. I can say now with all certainty, we just celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary. I feel closer and more intimate with my wife now since I put these burdens at the feet of Jesus than ever before. And it's great because now my kids are up and raised and now I get my wife all to myself and we get to do some amazing things with one another and, and, and are looking forward to not only the life that God gives us here, but the life that we will have in heaven. I want, to, want you to turn with me in John chapter 4. I mentioned earlier what happens when you surrender your heart and lay your burdens at Jesus' feet. Is that it? No more? Everything's good? How and what is God's kingdom going to be like? If you will turn with me in John chapter 4. Let's get our first John, I'm sorry. First John chapter 4. I'm actually going through some of the lesson studies. I've been going through the 28 Adventist beliefs. And this one centers on actually belief number 11, and that is growing in Christ. Should we be growing daily in Christ? You know, one of the things I found after I turned this burden and laid it at Christ's feet, that wasn't the end. That was the beginning, because now I had to build the relationship. See, if I had had a relationship with Jesus all along, I wouldn't have held on to these burdens for as long as I did. I would have set them at the feet of Jesus. And man, I would have had a much happier life when I was a younger person. And I encourage, especially our young people that accept Christ, stay close, hold on close. Your life will be much happier and healthier. Part of I believe the key. In verse, 1 John 4, verse 4, it says, You are of God, little children. I like the fact that God refers to us as his children. I like that. I like that God is our heavenly Father. It says, you are our little children and have, overcome, and have overcome them because he is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Are you glad of that? I am too. I have found in today's world, especially with the advent of the internet, there is so much garbage out there and misinformation and the things that you used to be able to trust, you cannot trust anymore. I am convinced there is only one thing in this world that is true and you can trust 100% and that is God's holy word 
in his promises to us. In verse 5, so they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Hmm. In verse 6, it said, we are of God, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us, but by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So what are we listening to? Excuse me, I'm going to take this coat off. I got a little hot trying to carry all these burdens here, so I'm going to set this right here. All right, so what are we holding on to? What's God saying here? Those that of the world hear the world, but those of God, do we hear God? Do you hear God speaking in your life? Do you hear him talking to you? Have you had a conversation with the Holy Spirit lately? I like it. I like those conversations. To be able to go in your work world and be working and having a conversation with the Lord. It's great. I really like those days. I really like those days. Verse 7 said, knowing God through what? What is God? What is the definition of God? Love. Now we're beginning to get a little glimpse of having one. Can we have love here on this earth? Is love in short supply? Let me ask you, is love in short supply on this earth? Yeah. Is love still attractive? If you don't believe me, Go around and start smiling at people come Monday morning. Especially if you're somebody that kind of has a scowl all the time and they'll about fall over. Just start smiling. You don't have to say anything. Just put on a cheery smile and disposition. It will attract people. People will want to know what you have been drinking. Verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now we're beginning to hone in on what heaven looks like and what we, since we have a job to do to go out and spread this gospel to the world. Let me ask you folks, how effective would we be going out to spread the gospel and pointing the finger at people and the sins in their life? How many people are we going to bring into God's kingdom? You might be surprised because you might be outside looking in. Love is what defines God. And we being his children have to take on that character. Is that, what is an easier emotion? Love or hate? It takes more discipline. Have you ever loved somebody and received they not receive that back does that change the fact that you still love a person because I think of that every time I disappoint my heavenly father and I fall back into sin does that change God's love for us or does he still love us we serve an amazing God an amazing God do you want to be in a mansion with him? Do you want to be in a mansion for eternity with a God that loves you unconditionally? Is that a place you want to be? Or is this something in this world that you find worth losing your mansion over? Verse number eight, or actually nine. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might have, that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Verse 11 says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. I know we are in a season of evangelism going on right now. Matter of fact, the pastor has talked about this being part of who we are, getting 
the message out. I am convinced, 100% convinced, that people are looking for love. Are people looking? How many people in this world know they're sinners? You don't think so? You think there's people in this world that know that they're sinning? They may not admit it, but they know that they got a problem? I think that's pretty well established, right? You're fooling yourself if you think you're perfect. None of us are perfect, right? So we don't have to rehash that over and over here in church, right? And to people, we know that we have a sin problem. What the world does not have is a sin answer. And we do. Are we happy about that? Sometimes I wonder. Sometimes I wonder about myself. I get consumed with the world's problems when I lose sight that we serve a God that has answers for the world's problems. And I think in America, we want things done right now, right? We're a, we're a country where things move quick. We want things done real quick. We want our salvation quick. We want things done quick. Does God work like a microwave? I think God works more like a slow cooker, right? He dealt with Moses 40 years, 40 years taking care of sheep before he was ready to work for the Lord. Is it any different with us? Are we taking the time every day to spend and grow in Christ? I hope you are. One of the things I know I experienced, and I know each and every one of you would say the same if you're honest, that when we were carrying these burdens, how close was your walk with the Lord? Were you spending time daily with your Heavenly Father, or were you trying to take the weight of the world on your shoulders? It's crazy now that I look back at it. I wish I could have all those wasted years I spent carrying these burdens and being separated from God. It's, it looked as foolish as me carrying that dumb, dumbbell around on my shoulders. But that's what we do over and over again. In verse 12, it says, No one has seen God at any time. Have you seen the Lord lately walking around? you seen God? Okay. Verse 12 says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. So, we got to love each other, right? Do we ever fight? Come on, let's be honest. We're a family here. Do we ever fight? Do we ever have disagreements? then you've never sat on a church board. We do have disagreements, right? We will have disagreements. But even in that, can we love each other but maybe disagree? Yeah. God gave us variety, right? I like vanilla ice cream. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Vanilla, really? Well, you can do a lot of things with vanilla ice cream. I bet if I ask each one of you, you would have a different opinion. God made us unique. Verse 13, it says, By this you know that we abide in him, then, and he in us, because he has given of us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Is that good news? All right. Verse 16, it says, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Well, I'm seeing a pattern here, right, over and over and over again. Love, love, love. Had that love. Love is like the elixir that God uses to reach us. And it is, I don't know about you, I love being around people that love me. It's It's nice. It's nice. In verse 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because he is, so are we in this world. Is the day of judgment coming? Seems like it's coming very quickly. Does it comfort you to know that God is in heaven right now, in the sanctuary? being an advocate for each and every one of us that, are fought, that surrendered our will to him, surrendered to God. Is that a winning hand? 
Can we smile about that? I think that's pretty good. I've never been to court. I don't, I know what it takes to go to jail and I don't like really, I don't want to go to jail. So, you know, follow the rules. But um, there is fear, right? Is there fear in this world? Do you know as Christians, we're not supposed to be fearful? Do you ever still experience fear? I do at times. How many here ever go by a worst case scenario? You ever, uh, I'm, I'm kind of wired that way. In every situation I go, well, what is the worst thing that could happen here? And if it's like, okay, I could live with that, then I'll move forward. What is the worst thing that can happen to somebody that believes and walks with the Lord? What is the worst thing? That's right. Mishaving them. I don't like funerals, but I've gone to a lot of them lately. It's not near as hard to go to a funeral with somebody you know that died and, got, and died with the Lord. Do you, do you ever think about that? Your next waking moment is having Jesus come. That may be a Brianism, and if I'm wrong, correct me, or if you know anything about this, I've always believed my guardian angel is going to be one that comes and plops me out of the grave and takes me up to see Jesus since he is not going to be touching this earth. But if that's the worst case scenario for a Christian is to die and wake up and see Jesus and go get to see that mansion it says Brian Nichols Mansion. Now y'all are invited. Because just because it's our mansion, we all have different tastes, right? If they allow me, I'll probably have a kayak sitting outside of mine. And if they've come over my mansion, we're probably gonna have to go paddling or something. But we have an amazing, amazing future. But are we to be selfish? with this information we have. Ah, our, there are people that, are, that have a, the most loving people you, you can think of in your mind, are they selfish people? Mm, I think the exact opposite. The people I've known that are loved the most, share the most. In verse 18, he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. That's interesting. He that has not been made perfect, or he that has, who fears, has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. There's a great song um, that talks about that. Ah, and this is the one we talk about. What is Jesus looking for the most in his people? We've talked about this before. What does God desire from his people? That's part of it. That's, that's a big part. What is it? Obedience. Obedience. That's right. Obedience is God it's into the mess we're into now because Adam and Eve and every generation since then have not been obedient. In verse 20, it talks about obedience by faith. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother... He is a what? He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen. All right, you see your brother. If you hate him, somebody you've seen, how in the world can you love a God who you have not seen? Tell me, how does that happen? But yet we do this all the time. Are you get? Glad God says we got to love each other here on this earth before we get a ticket to that mansion in heaven. I'm glad because I know what hate, hatred looks like and sin and suffering. We all do. Is this something we desire to see for eternity? I sure don't. Verse 21, it says, And this commandment we have from him, 
He that loves God must love his brother also. Is that easy? It's easy to love the people, you know, I kind of, I don't know. I'll admit something, I tend to like to hang around people that actually like me. Don't tend to hang around too much with people that despise me. Fortunately, I'm not aware of a lot of people that hate me, but I do know as I get older that I can walk away from those that I do not have something in common with. But what is Jesus? How does Jesus look at us? It says in chapter 5, and we're going to finish this up real quick. 1 John chapter 5 says, Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begat also love him, also he begat of them. In verse 2 it says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. You heard that before? Man, that seems to be a theme all the way from the Old Testament right up to the New. You know, the world doesn't believe that right now, right? I mean, I grew up where, you ever heard uh, the, the, you know, the commandments are nailed to the cross? It's very common. So why in the world, if this is true, is this repeated over and over again? Love God and keep his commandments. Does that require obedience? Is that an obedient act? Is that something we're going to see in heaven, along with love? Let me ask you, if you do those two things, if you are obedient, you surrender every morning, you start out your day asking the Lord to help you love like he loves and follow his commandments, do you think A, hatred, or B, love will grow in your heart, in your mind? A or B? Love or hate? or hate or love? Will we become a byproduct of what God desires us to be? For this is, in verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We just talked about burden. I tried to, I couldn't hold my burdens up for five minutes without sweating. Does God want us to hold on to our burdens? Are is loving God and keeping his commandments burdensome to you? And if it is, you might want to ask why. Are you holding on to this world a little too tight? In verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and, that, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith is what? What is the definition of faith? Say that out loud, Jerry. Substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. All right. And God just said, how in the world, if you have a brother who you can see, can you not love? And how in the world can you love a God which you have not seen? So can we start it out with this? Can we get a taste of heaven here on earth? And as Seventh-day Adventists who have a, been given a commission to go out and preach the gospel to the world, is it an option or is this a commandment that we are to follow? Are we to love one another? All right, verse 5. Well, let's finish this up. Who is he or who, is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I ask, I put out a, a question earlier, do you ever worry that sin, you know, because how many people here, if you're honest, struggle with sin every day? It's something, so I always worry, and this is, I'm sure this is where I know I go wrong and probably where we go wrong. It's like, okay, Lord. Heaven's going to be a place of no sin, but Lord, I sin every day. I, I don't want to, I don't desire to, but every day it's, I'm coming to you asking for forgiveness over and over and over. Lord, how, how in the world 
we have victory over sin. What are we lacking? What is it we lack? Why do we sin so much? What do we lack? And what's, what is, how do we make it less frequent in our life? What do we lack? Relationship with God. Relationship, okay. There's something I've noticed. It's kind of a, maybe you've noticed this. I see a lot of idleness in this world today. People are not, I like history, and I've noticed people 100 years ago were much more productive than people that live today. Is maybe one of our problems here is Seventh-day Adventist, and maybe the reason why we're still here and we struggle with loving one another is because we are idle. Are we to be an idle church? Are we to just come here, sit in our pews, maybe have a potluck, maybe a social a month, and then that's it. We're just a social club. Is that our calling? We had, Ryan, you were talking earlier about the, the, the amazing things that are going on in the Philippines right now, in Tanzania, and other places in the world. Why not here? Why not in the United States of America? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, we are holding on to this world too hard. We get ready to close. I shared with you earlier the problem and the burdens I was carrying for so many years. I know that I'm not the only person here that has struggled with that. I'm sure there's many that are listening this morning that maybe struggle with the same thing. I can tell you what one of the cures was, especially when it came with my relationship with my wife, was now instead of, well now, we study together. Every morning, my wife and I, we get up and we do our Sabbath school lesson together and we pray with one another. And I am telling you, I love my wife more now than I ever had before. And I know, I know, I know, it is because we are spending time with God. And if God is love and we spend time with God, we will love one another more. At this time, I believe before Jesus Christ comes, we will experience heaven here on earth. God's people will be walking so close. There's going to be two forces before Jesus comes. We are going to see sin poured out, unbridled. We are going to see how wicked, wicked can get. On the flip side, we are going to see what love, what real godly love looks like in this world poured out through his people when the Holy Spirit in the latter rain falls. And I pray that each and every one of you make, are making decisions daily to be part of that group. Dear Heavenly Father, we started out this sermon today talking about that mansion. Oh, that mansion that you have gone back to heaven to prepare for each and every one of us that believe in you. Lord, I hope that each and every one of us have made a decision to be with you. But Father, we have a work to do, Lord, and I know myself, and I'm sure each and every one of us here knows that we have to get this world out of our lives, Lord. And we have to surrender to you. Lay our burdens at your feet so that you may fill us up with your love and to go out and get this work done. Father, I pray that you'll be with each and every one this week. I pray that we spend time in your word this week, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit fills us up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.